Please welcome Dorothy Likes. Goodness. John assigned me to record this festival, and there, there have been some minor problems in that. There are no electrical outlets on this stage. There are in the bathroom and out front, and in all the hallways. Uh -huh. Yesterday, in the panel on politics and poetry, Dark Bob talked about politics of love. And I thought, well, that's wonderful, because my poetry falls in that category. My greatest joy is to take a historical event whoops, and tilt it a little, write it from a different perspective than one might normally feature as the outstanding event. My first poem is about the cremation of Shelley by his very dear friend, Captain Trelawney. Nor let us weep that our delight is fled by Percy Shelley. The devil's brewing mischief, my Genoese mate explains, pointing to dirty rag clouds hanging from a black line onto the Mediterranean the Mediterranean like molten lead sheened with olive oil. I, Shelley's closest friend, watch him through my spyglass. He stands in the bow of his deckless boat, reading a book I gave him by Keats, and looking more like a Greek hero than an Englishman, a boy at the tiller, steers too close to shore into a heavy fog chased by broiling clouds. Eleven days and nights I patrolled with police, searching, my stomach gripped in knots, tendrils of seaweed clung to the body when it surfaced. Keats' book, folded back on its spine, was in the rear pocket. Because of the spreading plague, police dump your body into a lie-filled trench, dear Shelley. Soggy driftwood makes a smoky beer. For fuel, for fuel, I pour more wine on you than you drank in your entire life. The cremation furnace was forged in haste, patterned after those used in Greece. The sheet iron bare and strong burns white. Heat from sun and funeral pyre fill the air, sickened, Byron, turns to run, his lameness hinders him. Reaching the sea, he swims a mile to his ship, the Bolivar. Officials turn their backs, move away from the heat, leaving me alone, dear Shelley. I reach into your body cavity and snatch your heart, still licked by little flames, and hide it to carry sealed with your ashes to roam to a tomb near your infant son and near deep sea grasses. In the same vein, another persona poem I enjoyed writing. I wrote after th reading the three volumes of Emily Dickinson's letters Emily's father, Edward Dickinson, died in the prime of life, addressing the Senate in Boston. He died from a stroke. I use his persona, Edward Dickinson. Emily, having invented an excuse from lonely chores, was with me my last afternoon. She blushed when I expressed my pleasure 
shared humor made bottled up laughter burst like little firecrackers. Toward evening, Emily chided me to exercise and I left to go walking as early night wind stirred the liquid mirror of rain slick Amherst. Stars turn over and die as dawn inhales the late spring of Emily's nosegay garden. Rose fragrance ruffles through my windows. I relish these moments of drifting between linen sheets on a feather bed until she knocks to wake me for the Boston train where, while I address the Senate, a stroke crackles like a glowing firebrand through my brain, opening an artery that lets my life run out. Upon my tomb, flowers are not allowed to wilt. She knew my heart was pure but terrible. She remains encumbered by my winding sheet. To prolong her penance for losing me, she will allow poems to lie unborn in the womb of her brain with a rod driven through to hold them spindled. A year to the day after Edward had a stroke and a year in which Emily didn't write because she was in deep grief, Emily's mother had a stroke that turned her into a vegetable. And for the 10 following years, Emily and her sister nursed the mother full time and there were no more poems after the father died. So in a sense, I was marking, according to her letters, the end. History presents coincidences. When I was a young woman, Harry Truman signed the permit for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so in 1980, on May 18th, when another Harry Truman came into national prominence, well, at least in the National Geographic and on TV, for dying in a major explosion. I thought that warranted a poem. Harry Truman, 1896 to 1980. Where huckleberry and vine maples splashed red in mossy forest, I walked Mount St. Helens autumn trails. Canoeing at dawn on Spirit Lake, I shared the reflection of the volcano symmetry with friends where only birds and dip of paddles broke the stillness. Steam and tremors warned the mountain might explode. They told me I should leave, but I was home and old men do not forsake their troubled friends. I lie buried with my lake beneath 200 feet of molten, cooling lava. When the forest died in the onslaught of liquefied mountain, sound waves lagged It was silent. Isn't that amazing? There was no noise with those trees going down. Dream magnet. Asking my memory to recall your face, your voice, so we can talk or smile one more time. There is nothing of you until like a magnet separates bits of iron from quartz. A dream probes beneath the tissue surface, drawing your mind apart from all the others. And I recognize the gentle contours etched there. 
not the dream itself, but the way I feel upon waking insulates me from this bleak day. I have two war poems. Because I'm older, I maybe had one extra war over some of you. 20th century cadence. Young men heard drums and marched in soldier suits, leaving sons fatherless who in their youth heard drums, kissed wives, and marched away, leaving fatherless children who have grown to hear the call of drums. The next poem I read in Bisbee one, one day, and so I want to dedicate it to a Tucson friend of mine, John Bret Hart, because he came up to me afterwards, and it, it had been a new poem, and I was very insecure. And he said, you touched me. And I've never gotten over that. It gave me a, a confidence that uh, is immeasurable. American Cemetery, Tunis, North Africa. For Harold Pauley, 1923-1943. Where are you, Harold? I call my eyes moving over hundreds of names deeply chiseled on perfect Carrara marble crosses. Sepia columns mark the ruins of Carthage outside the 10-foot wrought iron fence that encloses this American soil, its fountain and spiny grass. Clouds tint coral as from a minaret a prayer summons Muslims to kneel. The call is suspended in air over these graves five times a day for 40 years since you were beautiful with black brown eyes and youth. 8,000 killed in one battle. You incinerated in the tank Patton ordered you to drive across the desert. The only American I have met in Tunisia keeps this cemetery, locking its gates and registry every night at 5. At 5.15, seeing my wilting flowers, he unlocked a side door to allow me to find you if I hurry. Two of my daughters arranged a trek in Nepal and they had the contact so that we three women treated like royalty were taken out through Pokhara up into the high country. From my journal I took a, a longer poem, which I've been hesitant to share because I really thought it was a perfect illustration for a calendar, in other words, photographic. So you're very lucky because I've never gotten a calendar, but um, I'm presenting it now. Nepalese Trek. Waking dawn to color Himalayan giants cameo pink, a conch shell, vibrates the air, blown by a Tibetan Lama to proclaim a holy day. He draws a mandala and a giant dragon by dusting the earth with chalk as followers chant, Oh, where terraced Wheat ripples in waves. I watch ghost plumes off peaks give birth to clouds. 
Mountains create an amphitheater, and overhead an eagle flaps upside down to fight a shrieking kite. Talons out, the birds crash, fall, flail apart again and again in the morning. The trail moves into jungle. Long green moss drapes a cathedral of woven rhododendron limbs. Water oozes around my feet on the springy trail, carpeted by cerise blooms. White-faced monkeys play invisible where once majestic tigers roamed. A pine defying space is clamped on granite. Yesterday's sky becomes today's clouds at my feet. I struggle up a trail toward light and near the top find my path staring up another sun-filled ravine. In a mountain village, children, bare legs and bottoms, scramble on a dirt floor. One rushes out, slips on animal excrement, and covered with muck wails, I smile, namaste. The lad pauses, twinkles back, namaste, then runs crying for the mother. A golden jungle cock flapping wings squawks across a clean porch and races back chasing a screeching hen. I watch a chicken contemplating me. With unflinching persistence, it stands on one foot, then the other, never on both, feathers ruffled and furled. Men make percussion music chiseling granite into fitted bricks to trowel with mud in a plumb-lined house. Glacial water flowing from a pipe invites me. I submerge my head, feel iced to my toes, and I begin to sing. On the hill above me, seven children squatting watch my wildness. Once more, I rinse, laugh, and sing. As I trudge higher, seven children drench their heads and sing. Dressed in colorful hand-woven skirt and tunic, a Tibetan refugee carefully picks her way over the slick, muddy trail on Gorapani Pass, past a dead tree, tall and defiant, ram against darkened, rampaging clouds. Gauze prayer shawls, each one llama-blessed, flap from most branches, tattered white leaves releasing prayers to the wind. In a reed basket supported by woven straps around the mother's head, a child sits, his red bald cheeks bob above the basket's rim, and his black eyes absorb everything. Our resinless fire of leached wood heats the rakshi of burned butter, sugar, coffee crystals, and village brewed millet liquor, curried vegetables, lentils, and rice with sweetened milk and India tea warm me. At night, I rest sleeplessly watching stars I had thought were swallowed forever by city lights. My Sherpa's mantra. Through gaps in clouds, layers of blue mountains pale in immense distance. Soothed by my Sherpa's mantra, music of pure spirit, I dare to step to the sheer verge, but do not dare to tremble. I meditate where tendrils of icicles finger into a fern grotto bellows of water buffalo grazing on high slopes drop in strange octaves 
lower and lower as hours pass smoothly in less time. Sherpa Pasan Temba molds, molds a three ball mountain man of snow on Poon Hill. It stands in homage before Dalagari. My daughter, descending through clouds, sees this yeti and embraces him to kiss his serious mouth. His head plumps to the ground. Over Der Raleigh Pass, I pray for courage. A Buddhist Sherpa takes my hand. His foot taps direct my feet on juts of ice, slick granite. I look far down, undizzied. You know, when, when your life depends on someone who doesn't speak your language, and it did, my life did, because I was an expert. And these were very small juts of very slick granite. You have to have something. <laughs> and I was glad that he was very religious because I sure needed an awful lot of help from all kinds of gods at that point. I find jet lag a, a very real experience. So, having arrived home after the trip, jet lag, fishtailing from one reality to another in my ache to sleep, and turn day around 12 hours, I feel more dizzy than clear-headed as a slow procession of Tibetans burdened with supplies crosses my blankets. Straps around women's foreheads support baskets with one, sometimes two children riding. Leather whips accompany bells, a caravan of small donkeys led by one man trilling a bamboo flute. Pass. The lead donkey wears a colorful horse plume braided with yarn, tassels hanging. I cannot wake up. Wake up to unpack. Open mail or cut dandelions. So I bury myself under blankets, slip deeper and tell myself I am home home to a bathroom, to a stove, to a window, to trees with limbs I may cut, and to a porch where no starving man sleeps while he is being eaten by flies. I can drink the water, see through it, Half asleep, I swim up my bed, coming to an icy cliff. A slippery mud skin on the trail sheds everything into canyons below. I lie there and think about the different beds I have slept these past weeks. The night a rat pulled my hair to make his nest. Again, I am in a sleeping bag with a down jacket pillow, my head protruding from a tent on a 10,000 foot peak where sky fills with stars. I teach senior citizens and of course they're a wonderful resource. Recently one of my dear ladies, lover died. I'm talking senior citizens. I'm talking 70 and 80 year old. Okay, so um, as I listened to her describe this, I wanted to put it into a poem. The North Star holds steady. In the low hour of night, my hand crawls under the sheets to find the comfort of your hand. Without waking, you tighten around my fingers and I float in half sleep snug as a puppy nuzzling its cloth nest. Again at dawn, I take your hand. Unmoving coldness cuts my mind. I press your chest with my ear. Silence 
shatters. I have a thing on lightning. Once the family and friends were hiking in the high Sierras and a girl's hair stood up on end. So we laughed. And the ranger said, get out of here. Because those of you who are scientists know that when a storm, I don't know the terminology, ionizes or the mountain becomes ionized, that the place that's going to be hit is the place where the hair is standing on end. And then once I took a, a group of young people up to Grand Canyon and my daughter's hair stood on end. The canyon was full of raging clouds and we were running to the motel and I couldn't believe it because there she goes and she had long hair and it was on end. We ran. So I, I have this great feeling of respect. In Sunset Magazine recently there was an article about the seven causes of death in America from lightning. The third major cause of death in America from lightning is talking on the telephone. Figure that one. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You better remember it, too. I mean, that's ahead of being in a lake or playing golf. So I decided to, to uh, make an important poem out of lightning. Jerome James. I never even saw the horse they said I stole. But when Joe told me they were coming to string me up, I didn't wait, would you? I grabbed some hardtack and water, jumped on my filly, and rode straight out across the desert. If I could get to Yuma, a blood brother Indian would take me into Mexico. Who could have known such a large posse could travel so fast, matching my little nag speed? I feared they would hang me right away. Three days I barely kept ahead. The desert was parched, and dust my horse stirred spiraled like a smoke signal. When I would reach the wooden plank road laid, ov laid over the golden dunes west of Yuma, traveling became easier. I slid below the horizon behind mountains of sand. Hoof prints disappeared in afternoon winds. Heat consumed me. A cloud like a giant anvil began to cover the sky, thunder growled steadily. No place to take shelter. My horse and I stuck above the smooth sand. I knew I was in trouble when her mane stood straight up. The first bolt of lightning exploded us, boiled our blood before we hit the ground. The posse found us by the burning odor. They left my filly but rolled me, my remains into an Indian blanket and carried me to where a solid grave could be dug. Threw rocks on top to keep coyotes from digging me up. Even prayed over me before they headed home. Three days of hard riding ahead for them and none of them knowing I had robbed silver from their bank. Lots of silver. Don't see how anyone will find it without me. Nope, I never saw that horse they said I stole. Now, I'm really happy to have a public opportunity to present this poem. I think it's worth the whole festival having been created for. This is a um, political poem. <laughs> W.S. Merwin said yesterday, we take a position of anger and we have to do something with it. One morning at 5.30, I heard Mo Udall talking about his frustration that for all these years, the tailings from the uranium mines had been left above ground up near Four Corners. I checked this out this summer with Richard Shelton. He said, it's true. It's that gray mound. Navajo mother at Shiprock. The child's name is Minnie ribbons. Navajo mother at Shiprock. Many ribbons, waist-long pigtails, dance as she skips along the mound of debris, tailings from the abandoned uranium mine, a hill where she can practice being a brave. I'm going to interrupt here. I should have said this at the beginning. 
it is normal for there to be 105 male births to 100 female births. In the Four Corners area now, there are 85 male births to 100 female births. You can check that out. It's truth. So the little girl's practicing to be a brave. She sees her younger sister run to hide in the mine entrance while her mother looks after the herd of goats and sheep roaming freely where dust devils pick shards from the mine roads and spiral them abrasively. Many Ribbon's father has been sick two years. At night, she hears his strangled breath. Mother says half of the men who worked with him in the uranium mine are dead. The government takes a hard line. Many Ribbon's brother does not look like other babies. He lies silently in the house where mortar was made from mine debris several years ago. He does not grow. Many Ribbon's mother stares at giant red rocks standing against the searing sun. Long ago, white men paid bounties for dead Indians. Indians they killed quickly. W.S. Merwin also said yesterday, in Bisbee they ripped the copper out of the earth, leave slag all over the place, and call the hole that remains beautiful. My anger with Bisbee was a little different, but anger nevertheless. The value of a 1907 penny. In Bisbee's red hills, holes barred by chains become caves where men mined copper. A spider web of cracks on the surface remains to show how the mountain shattered. Each miner had three slender candles a day to light a day's work. Boulders were ruptured from tunnel walls, split with picks and hefted into hopper cars. Here's the, here's the hooker. Young mules hoisted through a narrow hole into the mine by a large strap around their chest strained under whips to move trains through tunnels. Dynamite ripped earth, and when fires broke out, smoke, dirt, stench of manure, and fumes filled all the narrow space, lodging cinders in the minor size. And in the eyes of mules who before going blind saw only pinpoints of candlelight in a lifetime of darkness. I have some trepidation about reading this, but Margaret, is Margaret here? I hope. Last night said I could read it. Isn't that nice? She's so beautiful and she gave me permission to read this poem. St. Joseph's Hospital, Santa Ana, California, 2 a.m., code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. 25 seconds of silence from the loudspeakers in this huge hospital. Code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. I start to count. My sister Ellen, roused from the slight relief a few minutes of sleep, gives. Has the doctor come yet? He promised. I will wait until he gets here. Code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. She has drifted again. Her mouth is black, rot from radiation. 
as she wa all she wants is to sip water. She request requested the staff doctor at noon. It will probably rain the and rain the day I die, she moaned through parched lips. Code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. Ellen blurts, why do they keep waking me with that announcement? Is it in all the rooms, waking everyone? It has been going on all night. Make them turn it off. Code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. In the darkness, I stare at the slight mound of my sister under the sheet and think. Code blue, cigarette smoking for emergency use only. Radiation, the cure for cigarette smoking, may rot your gums so you spit teeth onto a hospital sheet. Code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. The nurse comes in, empties the stomach pump bottle which has backed up and spilled some of its contents onto the bed. Ellen says, it has soaked me. The nurse leaves on silent feet. The doctor should be here soon. Code blue, third floor children's wing, all elevators and telephones for emergency use only. Ellen moves. You thought this would be a class AA hospital, didn't you? We are actually in Puerto Rico. Code blue, third floor children's wing. Planet Earth. I think all poets are indebted to the education channels on television for much of their poetry. Planet Earth. This winter moon drops shadows like holes sunk into earth, lying in night's chill, pulls oceans higher everywhere, dragging seas onto sand, beaches as people search skies for Halley's Comet. Seventy-five years ago, a woman I know saw Halley's Comet and tells about it all of her life knowing Another woman living in New Zealand remembers 10-foot-tall birds running in flocks across the South Island. She pet one as it rested. It rose with a growl to bite her. The bird is extinct. Since Halley's Comet last sliced through Earth's cosmos, and those who saw it will soon be gone. Final days. My mother died recently. As your nights become sleepless, your memory is devoured by a force like a great shark pulling pieces of meat, shaking them, back and forth, caught between grinding teeth, rupturing pockets of memory. Forgetting who we are, you call for Ray, your youngest brother who was gassed in World War I. Surgery waiting room. Fragile as cracked porcelain, your world becomes a room with no sky. I shall haunt this desert. You breathe as if death is a fantasy, with predators spiraling on waves of heat. The vision of you alive is the only light I see in the waking hours. Near the end, you fight for each breath until 
life, a stone falling, drops below the surface. They pry your hand from my grip and roll you to where makeup, artificial music, and flowers will fulfill every necessary formality. I drive alone into a monsoon desert. Cottonwood beside barbed fences fling themselves as though their backs would break. Black clouds suck light from the sky where one golden hawk flies on the storm's cutting edge. Two more? Okay. Desert liturgy. liturgy. He's giving me the sign I'm through. But see, I really am through. I mean, very nearly. <laughs> Scorching night winds, strum cactus spines. You are gone. You are gone as clouds shroud a skein of stars. I'm going to do that over. Robert Bly read in Tempe the other night, and he did everything over. <laughs> Scorching night winds strum cactus spines. You are gone. You are gone as clouds shroud a skein of stars. My final poem, Skeleton. Poetry should be music, a few notes. I treat them as bones, boil them for seven days in bleach and ice cream salt, sun them for desert ants to suck and shine. Then I arrange them in a pulsing line, and if they rattle, I walk away. Thank you. I think I'd take that. Thank you. I can't get it off. Yes, you can. Then I got it off. How long did I get? Forty. Oh God! I tried to. No, I tried to. I couldn't see you ever. I just thought I was afraid. But as soon as he said,